Thank you for that. And uh, welcome to Harrods. <laughs> That's in my contract, I have to plug it. Well, I, I think this is the coolest gig I've done in my whole life, and I, I'd really like to thank you all for coming. I hope you're enjoying your wine and everything. And um, I thought I'd spend um, <clears throat> the next hour, just under an hour maybe, um, reading old poems and new poems and give you an insight into <clears throat> my head, which is not dissimilar um, to this surroundings when I come to think of it. So I'm going to start with some poems from a book called The World's Wife, which I wrote about 10 years ago. And in that book, what I wanted to do was take all the stories and characters that I'd loved from childhood, um, from my school days, um, things that had stayed with me forever and <clears throat> become part of my inner landscape, made me not only the writer I am, but perhaps the person that I am. And these characters and stories come from fairy tale or mythology or the movies or history or music, wherever. And the very first one I wrote um, comes from Ovid's wonderful book, Metamorphoses, where everything and everyone changes. It was actually Shakespeare's favorite book throughout his life. <clears throat> and the first story um, I remembered from that book was the story of King Midas. And as a child, I was enthralled, enchanted, by that moment when he's given a wish by the gods and asked that everything he touches will turn to gold. <clears throat> but as an adult writer, I felt very queasy imagining being his lover shortly after that wish was granted. So here is Mrs. Midas. She's a woman of our time. She's a very good cook. She's in her kitchen, cooking away. Everything is going well. She pours a glug of cooking wine and then looks out through her kitchen window down right to the bottom of her garden where she sees her husband Midas up to no good. Mrs. Midas. It was late September. i just poured a glass of wine, begun to unwind while the vegetables cooked. The kitchen filled with the smell of itself, relaxed, its steamy breath gently blanching the windows. So I opened one, then with my fingers wiped the other's glass like a brow. He was standing under the pear tree snapping a twig. Now the garden was long and the visibility poor, the way the dark of the ground seems to drink the light of the sky. But that twig in his hand was gold. And then he plucked a pear from a branch. We grew fondant d'autum. And it sat in his palm like a light bulb on. I thought to myself, is he putting fairy lights in that tree? He came into the house. The doorknobs gleamed. He drew the blinds. You know the mind. I thought of the field of the cloth of gold and of Miss MacReady. He sat in that chair like a king on a burnished throne. The look on his face was strange, wild, vain. I said, what in the name of God is going on? He started to laugh. I served up the meal, for starters, corn on the cob. Within seconds, he was spitting out the teeth of the rip. He toyed with his spoon, then mine, then with the knives, the forks. He asked where was the wine. I poured with a shaking hand, a fragrant, bone-dry, white from Italy, then watched as he picked up the glass, goblet, golden chalice, drank. It was then that I started to scream. He sank to his knees. After we both calmed down, I finished the wine on my own, hearing him out. I made him sit on the other side of the room, keep his hands to himself. 
I locked the cat in the cellar. I moved the phone, the toilet I didn't mind. I couldn't believe my ears how he'd had a wish. Look, we all have wishes, granted. But who has wishes granted? Him. Do you know about gold? It feeds no one. Aurum, soft, untarnishable, slakes, no thirst. He tried to light a cigarette. I gazed, entranced, as the blue flame played on its luteous stem. At least, I said, you'll be able to give up smoking for good. Separate beds. In fact, I put a chair against my door, near petrified. He was below, turning the spare room into the tomb of Tutankhamun. You see, we were passionate then, in those halcyon days, unwrapping each other rapidly like presents, fast food. But now I feared his honeyed embrace, the kiss that would turn my lips to a work of art. And who, when it comes to the crunch, can live with a heart of gold? That night, I dreamt I bore his child, its perfect oar limbs, its little tongue like a precious latch, its amber eyes holding their pupils like flies. My dream milk burned in my breasts, I woke to the streaming sun. So he had to move out. With a caravan in a glade of its own, I drove him up under cover of dark. He sat in the back. And then I came home, the woman who married the fool who wished for gold. At first, I visited odd times, parking the car a good way off, then walking. You knew you were getting close, golden trout on the grass. One day a hare hung from a larch, a beautiful lemon mistake. And then his footprints glistening next to the river's path. He was thin, delirious, hearing, he said, the music of Pan from the woods listen. That was the last straw. What gets me now? is not the idiocy or greed, but lack of thought for me, pure selfishness. I sold the contents of the house and came down here. I think of him in certain lights, dawn, late afternoon, and once a bowl of apples stopped me dead. I miss most even now, his hands, his warm hands on my skin, his touch. Thank you very much. Um, another character from the same book, Metamorphoses, is Tiresias, perhaps not <clears throat> as well remembered, but those of you who love Eliot's great poem, The Wasteland, will recall that Tiresias um, is mentioned in that poem. <clears throat> now, I suppose Tiresias would have been um, a middle-aged man, and one day he decided he would go for a walk alone um, out in the woods, and on this walk, Tiresias came across two snakes attempting to mate. I have no idea what that might look like, <laughs> but he didn't like the look of it, and um, prevented it by beating the snakes to a pulp with his walking stick, as you would. And of course, the Greek gods were always looking down um, on what mortals were doing, in these stories, and they were very angry with Tiresias for slaughtering these snakes, and they punished him then and there 
by turning him into a woman for seven years. <laughs> and then at the end of that period, he, he could become a man again. It's a bit like being poet laureate, <laughs> I often think. So I wondered if you were married to him, how you would respond when he came home from his walk, thus chastised. And um, this poem is very much influenced by Shakespeare's great sonnet, the most popular um, poem at civil partnerships or weddings, um, Let Me Not To The Marriage Of True Minds Admit Impediment. Love is not love, which alters where it alteration finds. Mrs. Tiresias. All I know is this. He went out for his walk a man and came home female. Out the back gate with his stick, the dog, wearing his gardening kecks, an open neck shirt, and a jacket in Harry's tweed I'd patched at the elbows myself whistling. He liked to hear the first cuckoo of spring, then write to the times. I'd usually heard it days before him, but I never let on. I'd heard one that morning while he was asleep, just as I heard at about 6 p.m. a faint sneer of thunder up in the woods and felt a sudden heat at the back of my knees. He was late getting back. I was brushing my hair at the mirror and running a bath when a face swam into view next to my own. The eyes were the same, but in the shocking V of the shirt were breasts. When he uttered my name in his woman's voice, I passed out. Life has to go on. I put it about that he was a twin, and this was his sister come down to live while he himself was working abroad. And at first I tried to be kind, blow drying his hair till he learnt to do it himself, lending him clothes till he started to shop for his own, sisterly, holding his soft new shape in my arms all night. Then he started his period. <laughs> One week in bed. <laughs> Two doctors in. Three painkillers four times a day. And later, a letter to the powers that be demanding full paid menstrual leave 12 weeks per year. I see him still, his selfish, pale face, peering at the moon through the bathroom window. The curse, he said, the curse. Don't kiss me in public, he snapped the next day. I don't want folk getting the wrong idea. It got worse. After the split, I would glimpse him out and about entering glitzy restaurants on the arms of powerful men, though I knew for sure there'd be nothing of that going on if he had his way, or on TV, telling the women out there how, as a woman himself, he knew how we felt, his flirt smile. The one thing he never got right was the voice, a cling peach slithering out from its tin. I gritted my teeth. And this is my lover, I said, the one time we met at a glittering ball under the lights among tinkling glass and watched the way he stared at her violet eyes, at the blaze of her skin, at the slow caress of her hand on the back of my neck and saw him picture her bite her bite at the fruit of my lips, and hear my red, wet cry in the night as she shook his hand, saying, how do you do? And I noticed then her hands, 
his hands, the clash of their sparkling rings and their painted nails. And the next poem um, looks at Aesop's fables. Um, I don't know how many of you here had those at school. We used to, in little school, sit on the carpet at the end of the day and have uh, an Aesop's fable read. And like all children, I loved um, stories with animals in them. So I always felt very disappointed and let down by Aesop, I think because of the, the moral tact on the end, which never seemed to um, kind of be truthful, I suppose. I was also interested <coughs> in the amount of cliché, even in translation, that Aesop has managed to deposit, as it were, um, in our language. So everything in this poem is, is, is from Aesop. Um, I couldn't find out very much about him, <clears throat> except that he was very famous in his time for his, his fables, um, even though he was a, a slave, um, so not privileged at all. Uh, and also he was tiny, even for the times that um, he lived in. So both of these factors um, inform this poem. And for some reason, as I, I have no explanation for, I pitched the whole poem in my mother's way of, of talking. No doubt analysis would explain that. But <laughs> So here is Mrs. Aesop. By Christ, he could bore for purgatory. He was small, didn't prepossess, so he tried to impress. Dead men, Mrs. Aesop, he'd say, tell no tales. Well, let me tell you now that that bird in his hand shat on his sleeve. Never mind the two worth less in the bush. <laughs> Tedious. Going out was worst. He'd stand at our gate, look, then leap. Scour the hedgerows for a shy mouse, the fields for a sly fox, the sky for one particular swallow that couldn't make a summer. The jackdaw, according to him, envied the eagle. Donkeys would, on the whole, prefer to be lions. On one appalling evening stroll, we passed an old hare snoozing in a ditch. He stopped and made a note. And then, about a mile further on, a tortoise, somebody's pet, creeping slow as marriage up the road. <laughs> slow but certain Mrs. Aesop wins the race. Asshole. <laughs> what race? What sour grapes? What silk purse, sour's ear, dog in a manger? What big fish? Some days I could barely keep awake as the story droned on towards the moral of itself. Action, Mrs. A speaks louder than words. And that's another thing. The sex was diabolical. <laughs> I gave him a fable one night about a little cock that wouldn't crow. A razor-sharp axe with a heart blacker than that pot that called the kettle. I'll cut off your tail, all right, I said, to save my face. That shut him up. <laughs> I laughed last. Longest. <laughs> Hope my mother forgives me. It's a very tiny poem I stole from the diary of the wife of... Charles Darwin, another man big on ideas. Mrs. Darwin. 7th of April, 1852, went to the zoo. I said to him, something about that chimpanzee over there reminds me of you. <laughs> That's 
That's very cheap shot, I know. <laughs> and then the last one from The World's Wife is, is probably my favourite um, of all the, the old stories, the story of Faust. And you remember that Faust sold his soul to Mephistopheles, to the devil, in exchange for unimaginable wealth and power. Kind of like Nick Clegg. <laughs> but at the end um, of 25 years in, in Faust's case, less than the others, Faust had to pay um, with his soul. So here is Mrs. Faust's um, account of this. She isn't a very nice person herself. Um, she's unpleasant, she's materialistic, hedonistic, a big consumer, very pragmatic. She met Faust when they were students at university together. And um, after an on-off relationship, she decided to back this particular horse. Mrs. Faust. First things first, I married Faust. We met a student, shacked up, split up, made up, hitched up, got a mortgage on a house, flourished academically, BA, MA, PhD, no kids, two towered bathrobes, hers, his. We worked, we saved, we moved again, fast cars, a boat with sails, a second home in Wales, the latest toys, computers, mobile phones. We prospered, moved again. Fast face? Clever, greedy, slightly mad. I was as bad. I grew to love the lifestyle, not the life. He grew to love the kudos, not the wife. He went to whores. I felt not jealousy, but chronic irritation. I went to yoga, tai chi, feng shui, therapy, colonic irrigation. <laughs> and Faust would boast at dinner parties of the cost of doing deals out east, then take his lust to Soho in a cab to say the least, to lay the ghost, get lost, meet panthers, feast. He wanted more. I came home late one winter's evening, hadn't eaten. Fast was upstairs in his study in a meeting. I smelled cigar smoke, hellish, oddly sexy, not aloud. I heard Faust and the other laugh aloud. Next thing, the world, as Faust said, spread its legs. First, politics, safe seat, MP, right hon, KG, then banks, offshore, abroad, and business, vice chairman, chairman, owner, lord. Enough? Encore, Faust was cardinal, pope, knew more than God, flew faster than the speed of sound around the globe, lunched, walked on the moon, golfed, Hold in one, there's a fat Havana on the sun. Then he backed a hunch, invested in smart bombs, in harms. Faust dealt in arms, Faust got in deep, got out, bought farms, cloned sheep. Faust surfed the internet for like-minded Bo Peep. As for me, I went my own sweet way. Saw Rome in a day, spun gold from hay. Had a facelift, had my breasts enlarged, my buttocks tightened. Went to China, Thailand, Africa, returned, enlightened. Turned 40, celibate, teetotal, vegan, Buddhist, 41. Went blonde, went redhead, went brunette, went native, went ape, went berserk, went bananas, went on the run, alone, <clears throat> went home. <laughs> Fast was in. A word, he said. 
I spent the night being pleasured by a virtual Helen of Troy. Face that launched a thousand ships, I kissed its lips. Thing is, I've made a pact with Mephistopheles, the devil's boy. He's on his way to take away what's owed, reap what I sowed. For all these years of gagging for it, going for it, rolling in it, I've sold my soul. At this, I heard a serpent's hiss, tasted evil, knew its smell. A scaly devil hand poked up right through the terracotta Tuscan tiles at Faust's bare feet and dragged him, oddly smirking, there and then straight down to hell. Oh, well. Fast will left everything, the yacht, the several homes, the Learjet, the helipad, the Lucy, set, set the lot to me. C'est la vie. <laughs> when I got ill, it hurt like hell. I bought a kidney with my credit card, then I got well. I keep Faust's secret still. The clever, cunning, callous, bastard, didn't have a soul to sell. Uh, Thank you very much. I have a, <clears throat> a young uh, composer friend, Tim, in, who wanted to hear me read them. So now you know how they sound. I'm going to read um, some love poems now from a collection called Rapture. Um, <clears throat> and these are 52 poems which tell the story of a love affair from its beginnings through all its ups and downs to its ending. And as Shakespeare demonstrates, I think the sonnet is the best form for the love poem. I think sonnets are able to enter us as prayers can um, because of their form and their, their brevity. They're like the, the kind of little black dress of poetry, I feel. So all, the, all of these poems are kinds of sonnets, either formal Shakespearean sonnets or informal, more contemporary sonnets, or sometimes broken sonnets to reflect the, the fracturing of the relationship. Um, so I, I won't introduce the handful of, of poems I read from this book, but I will read them in order. And, and because I wanted each poem um, to focus on the moment that provoked the poem in, in the way that the, the, the sand or the grit in the oyster provokes the pearl, um, I tried very hard to just give them one word, um, one piece of grit, one word titles. So I'll just read these through, <coughs> just with their titles, but as I say, in order of events. <coughs> Text. I tend the mobile now like an injured bird. We text, text, text our significant words. I reread your first your second, your third. Look for your small X, X, feeling absurd. The codes we send arrive with a broken cord. I try to picture your hands, their image is blurred. Nothing my thumbs press will ever be heard. Tea. I like pouring your tea, lifting the heavy pot and tipping it up so the fragrant liquid steams in your china cup. Or when you're away or at work, I like to think of your cupped hands as you sip, as you sip, of the faint half-smile of your lips. 
I like the questions, sugar, milk, and the answers I don't know by heart yet. For I see your soul in your eyes, and I forget. Jasmine, gunpowder, Assam, Earl Grey, Salon. I love teas, names. Which tea would you like, I say? But it's any tea for you, please, any time of day. As the women harvest the slopes for the sweetest leaves on Mount Wu Yi. And I'm your lover, smitten, straining your tea. <coughs> Rao. But when we rowed, the room swayed and sank down on its knees. The air hurt and purpled like a bruise. The sun banged the gate in the sky and fled. But when we rowed, the trees wept and threw away their leaves. The day ripped the hours from our lives. The sheets and pillows shredded themselves on the bed. But when we rowed, our mouths knew no kiss, no kiss. Our hearts were jagged stones in our fists. The garden sprouted bones grown from the dead. But when we rowed, your face blanked a page erased of words. My hands squeezed themselves, burned like verbs. Love turned and ran and cowered in our heads. Syntax. I want to call you thou, the sound of the shape of the start of a kiss like this, thou, and to say after, I love, thou, I love, thou I love, not I love you, because I so do, as we say now, I want to say thee, I adore, I adore thee, and to know in my lips, the syntax of love resides and to gaze in thine eyes. Love's language starts, stops, starts, the right words flowing or clotting in the heart. Art. Only art now. Our bodies, brushstroke, pigment, motif. Our story, figment, suspension of disbelief. The thrum of our blood, percussion, chords, minor for the music of our grief. Art, the chiseled, chilling marble of our kiss. Locked into soundless stone, our promises or fizzled into poems, page print for the dried flowers of our voice. No choice for love, but art's long illness, death. Huge theatres for the echoes that we left, applause, then utter dark. Grand opera for the passion of our breath. And the Oscar-winning movie in your heart, and where my soul sang, croaking, art. And in the last poem I'll read from Rapture, um, a poem called The Love Poem, um, what I've done here is, is um, summon um, lines from great love poems of the past, as it were, to... Um, 
to support my poem to line up in the shadows. And um, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear many echoes of, of poems that you remember or half remember um, in, this, in this one. The love poem. To love exhausts itself, longs for the sleep of words. My mistress eyes to lie on a white sheet at rest in the language. Let me count the ways or shrink to a phrase like an epitaph. Come live with me or fall from its own high cloud as syllables in a pool of verse one hour with thee. Till love gives in and speaks in the whisper of art. Dear heart, how like you this. Love's lips pursed, quotation marks kissing a line. Look in thy heart and write. Love's light fading, darkening, black as ink on a page. There is a garden in her face. Till love is all in the mind, oh, my America, my new found land, or all in the pen in the writer's hand, behold, thou art fair, not there, except in a poem known by heart like a prayer, both near and far, near and far the desire of the moth for the star. And I'm going to read now some more recent poems, um, some unpublished, some from a collection called The Bees. Some on scraps of paper, it would seem. Um, just before I was elevated to my great status, <laughs> um, I had a poem banned from an exam board. Uh, if there's any people who work in education, you'll remember this. Um, it's a poem called Education for Leisure, which I'd written over a quarter of a century ago when I first started as a, a young poet. Um, and for me, it was a anti-unemployment pro-education poem um, written at the time when Meryl Streep was prime minister. <laughs> Don't you wish. Um, anyway, it ended up on a, a GCEC exam, whatever they're called, and uh, an invigilator had peeped over a student's shoulder, read this poem, which ended with the image of a knife, and decided that I'd written the poem in, in order to incite the youth of Great Britain to commit knife crime. <laughs> and she wrote to her MP, the MP complained to the exam board, and the, the poem was removed, pulped, shredded, and the whole thing reprinted, and where my poem had been, it just said, this page has deliberately been left blank. <laughs> no one talked to me about this, and I knew nothing about it till The Guardian phoned me up, saying, did I have anything to say? <laughs> and then I decided, <clears throat> over a glass of wine at home, that the best response would be a poem. Um, and I, as I always do in times, <laughs> times of stress, I went back to Shakespeare. So this is Mrs. Schofield's GCSE. That was her name, Mrs. Schofield. <laughs> this is being filmed. <laughs> you must prepare your bosom for his knife, said, Portia to Antonio in which of Shakespeare's comedies? Who killed his wife insane with jealousy? And which Scots witch knew something wicked this way comes? Who said, is this a dagger which I see? 
witch tragedy, whose blade was drawn which led to Tybalt's death? To whom did dying Caesar say, et tu, and why? <laughs> Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Do you know what this means? Explain how poetry pursues the human, like the smitten moon above the weeping, laughing earth, how we make prayers of it. Nothing will come of nothing, speak again, said by which king. You may begin. And in the same um, spirit of <coughs> mild protest, I'd like to read um, a poem called The Counties. And um, I wrote this when <coughs> the post office, if, if, we, if they still exist, I'm not sure. Yeah, they do? Okay. Um, said that we now mustn't put the names of the counties down when we write our letters. It gets in the way of the post code. And when I heard this, I was consumed with a kind of middle-aged fury. <laughs> um, and I wondered why I felt <coughs> so disappointed and angry. And I, I managed to get it down to two reasons, very obvious reasons. One, childhood, probably like many of you here, I, even though I was not told not to do it, I loved writing my <coughs> name and address in all my books. So in my case, it was Caroline Duffy, 21 Poplar Way, Mosspit, Stafford, Staffordshire, England, Great Britain, <laughs> <coughs> Europe, the world, the universe, the solar system, my parents were Catholics, near God. <laughs> and you really need the county in there to, um, to make it work. And the, the second reason was a, another obvious one, a, a poetry reason, like most poets I love to name um, in my poems to um, celebrate a person or a place or an animal or whatever it might be, even to use a list of, of such special names. And um, one of my favorite short lyric poems um, is that lovely poem, Adelstrop by Edward Thomas, which he wrote before the Great War. And you remember in that poem, his, his old steam train chugs to a halt in the middle of England and he listens to all the sounds and then names where he is. So I, I quote um, Edward Thomas at the end of this poem, The Counties. But I want to write to an Essex girl, greeting her warmly, but I want to write to a Shropshire lad, brave boy home from the army. And I want to write to the Lincolnshire poacher to hear of his hair. And to an auntie in Bedfordshire who makes a wooden hill of her stare. But I want to post a rose to a Lancashire lass, red, I'll pick it. And I want to write to a Middlesex mate for tickets for cricket. But I want to write to the Ayrshire cheesemaker and his good cow. And it is my duty to write to the Queen at Berkshire in praise of Slough. Not really. <laughs> but I want to write to the National Poet of Wales at Ceredigion in celebration. And I want to write to the Dorset giant in admiration and to the Inland Revenue in Yorkshire in desperation. <laughs> But I want to write to my uncle in Clack Manninshire in his kilt and to my scrumptious cousin in Somerset with her cidery lilt. But I want to write to two ladies in Denbyshire near Clangochlan. And I want to write to a laddie in Lanarkshire, dear Lachlan. But I want to write the names of the counties down for my own child and may they never be lost to her or the birds of Oxfordshire, Gloucestershire.
water. Your last word was water, which I poured in a hospice plastic cup, held to your lips, your small sip, half smile, sigh, then in the chair beside you fell asleep. Fell asleep for three lost hours, only to waken, thirsty, hear, then see, a magpie worn in a bush outside, dawn so soon, and swallow from your still full cup. Water, the times I'd call as a child for a drink, till you'd come, sit on the edge of the bed in the dark, holding my hand, just as we held hands now, and you died. A good last word. Night since I've cried, but gone to my own child's side with a drink. Watched her gulp it down, then sleep. Water, what a mother brings through darkness still to her parched daughter. another place, Liverpool. Um, I wrote this poem the beginning of last year when the Hillsborough Report was published. I went to university in Liverpool um, and lived there for about a decade, um, a city I, I still love very much. And I, as a student, I would go to all the home games at Anfield. Um, for those of you who like football, it was the Keegan, Toshak, Stevie Highway period. So I always felt um, a great deal of grief for those brave families of the people who died in, in Hillsborough. And um, the sonnet is for them, Liverpool. The Cathedral Bell told, could never tell, nor the liver birds mute in their stone spell, or the Mersey, the seagulls wailed, cursed overhead in no language for the slandered dead. Not the raw red throat of the cop keening, or the cop's words censored of meaning, not the clock, slow hand-clapping the coroner's deadline, or the memo to Thatcher, or the tabloid headline. But fathers told of their daughters, the names of sons on the lips of their mothers were prayers, lost ones honoured for bitter years by orphan, cousin, wife, not a matter of football, but of life. Over this great city, light after long dark, and truth, the sweet silver song of a lark. <clears throat> the penultimate poem I'll read um, goes back to the title of this collection, The Bees. And I think we all know that the, the bee is very much the canary <clears throat> in the mine um, for what we're doing environmentally. Colony collapse disorder means that one morning the beekeeper will go to the hive and the bees have vanished. They've, been unable to find their way back. Um, and you don't need me to tell you why that is. In large parts of China, farmers are now having to employ people to pollinate um, 
their orchards by hand because the bees are vanishing. If they don't do this, they will have no fruit. So that's behind this penultimate poem, The Human Bee. I became a human bee at 12 when they gave me my small wand, my flask of pollen, and I walked with the other bees out to the orchards. I worked first in apples, climbed the ladder into the childless arms of a tree and busied myself, dipping and tickling, duping and tackling, tracing the petal's guidelines down to the stigma. Human, humming, I knew my lessons by heart. The ovary would become the fruit, the ovule, the seed, fertilized by my golden touch, my Midas dust. I moved to lemons, head and shoulders lost in blossom, dawn till dusk, my delicate blessing. All must be docile, kind, unfraught, for one fruit, pomegranate, lychee, nectarine, peach, the rhymeless orange. And if an opening bud was out of range, I'd jump from my ladder onto a branch and reach. So that was my working life as a bee, till my eyesight blurred, my hand was a trembling bird in the leaves, the bones of my fingers thinner than ones. And when they retired me, I had my wine from the silent vines, and I'd known love, and I'd saved some money, but I could not fly, and I made no honey. Thank you very much. Well, as you can tell from these more recent poems, they have quite a elegiac um, disposition. Um, and earlier, I read a poem called Water about my mother. And I'd like to finish with another poem um, about her, a poem called Premonitions. And in this poem, I imagine that the very first time I meet my mother is at the moment of her death, um, when, when I was with her. Um, but the poem's a kind of resurrection poem, and it allows us to get to know each other backwards through time, um, in reverse, from death onwards. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Premonitions. Mm. We first met when your last breath cooled in my palm like an egg, you dead, and a bird outside sang it was morning. I backed out of the room, feeling the flowers freshen and shine in my arms. The night before, we met again to unsay unbearable farewells to see our eyes brighten with re-strung tears. Oh, I had my sudden wish, though I barely knew you, to stand at the door of your house, feeling my heartbeat calm as they carried you in, home, home and healing. Then, slow weeks, removing the wheelchair, the drugs, the oxygen mask and tank, the commode, the appointment cards, until it was summer again, and I saw you open the doors to the grace of your garden. Strange and beautiful to see the flowers close to their own premonitions, the grass sweeten and cool and green where a bee swooned backwards out of a rose. There you were, a glass of lemony wine in each hand, walking towards me always, 
your magnolia tree marrying itself to the May air. How you talked and how I listened, spellbound, humbled, daughterly, to your tall tales, your wise words, the joy of your accent, un-English, dancey, humorous, watching your ash hair flare and redden, the loving litany of who we had been, making me place my hands in your warm hands, younger than mine are now. Then time, only the moon, and the balm of dusk, and you, my mother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.